Thank you for staying with us. You're still watching The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. It's time to look at the headlines that made it to the front pages of our national dailies this morning. And joining us to review the papers is Professor Kamilu Sani Fage. He's from the Department of Political Science by Euro University, Kanu. Good morning, Prof. Thank you for joining us this morning. Good morning and thank you for having me. As always. All right, let's get straight into the papers. And this morning, we'll be starting with The Guardian. And now, The Guardian leads with electricity tariff may, may spike over weak fiscal position. 2.1 trillion Naira subsidy. There are some writers here that says concerns as NERC removes federal government from commercial, um, from commercial model and forces bilateral markets. Another one says liquidity worsens four years after CBN sets up exco accounts. And finally, power plants may shut down as poor remittances threaten 6,000 megawatts ta target. Well, I don't even know if we have the 6,000 megawatts because I know that um, as of last week, we're still talking about generating 5,000 megawatts. In fact, it was being celebrated that we're generating 5,000 megawatts. Um, but yeah, we're talking about electricity tariff may spike. So we know how for Band A customers, the, the, their tariff moved up with almost 300%. So if you were paying about 65 Naira, you were moved to Band A, um, and you were paying about 206 Naira per kilowatt, which is a lot of people called excruciating. Um, it was a struggle for, you know, most companies, um, most homes as well, because you don't have enough money. The economy isn't the best, but then you have to pay this high tariff. Now, if we're seeing that it may spike again, what does that mean for Nigerians? Where are we going to? Uh, it means more problem, and uh, it means also most of our industries will collapse. Hmm. Because, you see, the usual thing, um, the government is saying that uh, it, 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 there is a uh, subsidy of about 2 point something trillion, yeah. which is the usual way of applying the kite. Uh, eventually, when they raised these issues and that uh, it was uh, in three months, they paid how many billions of Naira mm. to that. Now the government is going to withdraw and then allow, as usual, the market forces to, uh, you know, take effect. And what is going to happen is that uh, the other bonds, like uh, B to E, mm. these are the ones that the government said is subsidizing. So it is going to withdraw. So we are going to see an increase uh, in the tariff, electricity tariff. And this will add up to the woes of Nigerians. Already we have problems with, uh, you know, uh, uh, the petroleum sector. Uh, there is high inflation. The industries are collapsing. And now by the time the government um, uh, give effect its own uh, proposal, then we are going to see, you know, the, you know, the increase in, in the cost of uh, electricity tariff and it's going to be across the board. Now, like you said, Band A is now about uh, 209. Yeah, 209 kilowatts, yeah. By kilowatt. Mm. And already you see so many things, uh, like about a month or uh, two months or so, uh, some hospital said they cannot uh, run this thing because their bill is in hundreds of millions per month, and even universities in hundreds in, uh, of millions per month. So what we are going to see is um, if care is not taken, grounding of uh, the economic sector in all aspects by this uh, increase. As if, you see, as if it is a, a, a curse to be a Nigerian. Although the government will always talk of uh, subsidy, subsidy, and so on, they, they, they don't see the implication of that. All they are concerned is they apply the kite and eventually they take the decision that they are going to increase it. Hmm. So I know that most countries, other countries, 
they subsidize one thing or another for you know the citizens so it's either you're subsidizing education for instance in the uk international students pay so much more compared to um uk citizens or people who are from the eu so their own fees is highly subsidized for their people in the us food is highly subsidized because you can buy food they feel like it's one of the basic things that you should be able to get so you're seeing other countries subsidizing one thing or another in the past before may 29 and last year 2023 before the um president assumed office nigeria was subsidizing petrol for its citizens so if that has been taken out and now there is no form of subsidy, I'm wondering what this government is doing for its people. Because if you are saying you're paying so much for electricity, um, why do you have to take that now when other countries are just trying to ensure that the welfare of the people, you know, they just have a better welfare package. So why are they taking this saying it's a lot? Power stations might shut down. So that's some form of threat to the people that if you're not going to pay this amount, then you might probably get no electricity at all. So what is Nigerian government doing for its people? Yeah, I don't know what it's doing. Nobody can say uh, the government is doing anything for the people uh, yeah. in terms of improving their own welfare. Uh, what we are seeing is that uh, as if it is a curse, this issue of uh, subsidy, you know, the government keeps on uh, withdrawing from so many things. And uh, they fail to note that um, where you impoverish your people, uh, there is a, it's, a, it's a recipe for so many social crises that you are going to pay. And uh, you are to face. And you are also going to pay economic, pay economic crisis. It is true. All over the world, countries, you know, subsidize one thing or another for their own citizens. But here we are. Uh, the government will always say we are subsidizing X, Y, Z. And by the time they are saying that is that uh, as a, a subsidy, they will roll up humongous uh, figures and say that they are subsidizing in this area. And then eventually they will uh, withdraw. And the other strategy is they squeeze the people. Like if it is on foil issue, they, you, you see long queues for days or for months until the people are tired. And then when you bring due the uh, price, they will take it. The same thing they are saying, if we don't pay more, uh, the electricity sector will collapse and that there will be a national problem. And so that, you know, they scare the people into uh, accepting whatever is being dashed to them. And I think this is quite unfortunate that uh, especially it is a democratic government that is supposed to be responsive and uh, responsible to the people. But uh, uh, the government is always saying subsidy is a problem and so we are going to withdraw and gradually they are withdrawing. Uh, it seems like um, I'm sorry to say we haven't taken any lesson from the just concluded uh, protest, hunger protest in Nigeria. So by the time you squeeze, we are now creating more chances for a crisis to take place. That crisis doesn't happen, and you know the government starts to, you know, put what is what is necessary in place. We're talking about welfare of Nigerians. Just make sure that that is being put in place and be empathetic towards the people because you just can't keep taxing them. You can't keep increasing um, basic necessities that they need in life. At some point, they would be pushed to the wall, and when they do, they will always push back. Another, um, you know, headline here says National Assembly pushes back on pay storm as OB others flee costs of governance. One of the major things that we're talking about um, with this administration is the cost of governance. Um, the, we have an over bloated cabinet. There are so many people that are being appointed. And of course, um, monies have to be spent. We have so many ministries that, in fact, the oral science report had said we need to merge all of this. Why do we have the EFCC and the ICPC? You know, all of these are like, you know, duplicating uh, the same ministry. Well, as of right now, some of the lawmakers in the National Assembly are pushing back on their pay storm because other people have spoken about it. But I want to get your take. Do you think this is just some 
PR stunts, maybe just to look good in the public eye? Yeah, it is a PR and it is a, a political deception of uh, the people. Uh, if the members of the assembly say they are going to cut their own salary, you know, it, it is not the salary that is that matters. How much is it that they are going to cut in that one? The whole thing is in their allowances. That yeah. is where the money is, yeah. which are unnecessarily, you know, expenses. And if you look at uh, what uh, happening, what is happening in Nigeria, even you zero in on the assembly alone, you see that uh, Nigeria is perhaps among the past. If it is not the past, it will not be more than the past five uh, percent of the countries where you have uh, the cost of government is so high, it's expensive. Now, if not because the Naira has been devalued, if you are to take the net take home of Nigerian senator and you compare it with the net take home of the American president, uh, you see that a senator, a Nigerian senator, earns more than the American president. Hmm. Uh, yeah, that is the reality because uh, it is only now that the Naira has been devalued that perhaps they can compete neck to neck uh, because the whole spending, the whole cost is not in the salary. Of course, the salary is there, uh, that it is according to the Revenue and Fiscal Mobilization Committee, that is what they say, but it is the allowances that they have. In fact, that was what um, former President Obasanjo said, yeah. you cannot fix your own uh, salaries and allowances, and now you come out and say you, you are cutting it by uh, 50%, and you are not cutting those expenses. And everybody knows in Nigeria, it has been real out several times that these are newspaper, this is a dressing allowance, car allowance, and so on. By the time you add up, somebody will be earning how many millions of Naira per month? And uh, the same government that cannot afford to pay even 70,000 uh, per month for its workers. And here is somebody earning uh, uh, tens of millions, about 20 to 30 million naira per month to net take home. And now you come out and say, you look at only that uh, maybe 600,000 salary and you cut it to 300,000. It's not even like a drop in an ocean. Uh, what they are trying to do is just a, a political gimmick, a deception that they are taking it. And I don't think there is a sincerity in that one, because if that is what they want to do, they should look at their total network form, cut it down, and now put uh, something so that at least we can see them as being, you know, leading by example. Because you cannot expect people calling them to sacrifice, to endure, to do these things while people are spending. Look at uh, it, like uh, everybody is rising for cars, for allowances, for these things and so on. So much so that uh, actually by the time you take a calculation of our budget, about 70% of budget goes on recurrent and about 50% uh, of that one just goes to uh, allowances to the political office holders. Hmm. Well, let's look at another story here on The Guardian. It says, a dough refinery decries NNPCL's failure to supply crude. Now, um, a dough refinery has requested for, I think, a thousand barrels per day. That's what they need to um, fully function. However, they've been asking for, for this and they don't get it, despite the directive that has been given by the president, you know, for NNPCL to supply Dangote refinery and other modular refineries, um, you know, with crude. But yet they said they've tried their best and they're still not getting what they require. In fact, a dairy refinery as of today is only functioning at 10% capacity. Why do you think that the NNPCL isn't giving these refineries what they need? And especially for the fact that the price of petrol is so expensive with subsidy being gone. Is it not time that we start to really, um, you know, look at our refineries and make sure that they are up to full capacity? 
the Portacot refinery was said to, well, we are in August, was said to be opened in August, even though they postponed the date so many times. Um, Kajina refinery is said to be opened in December, which we're not sure if that's really going to happen. But we've seen Edo refinery, just a small um, capacity refinery of a thousand barrels per day. They're still not even able to get the crude. What do you think is happening with the um, oil sector, the petroleum sector, and why are we not really looking at this holistically to ensure that we have a sustainable environment for all of these refineries to thrive? Yeah, you see, well, the, the reason is uh, political, uh, and the policies that are against it are outsiders, I mean, uh, foreign powers that uh, don't want to see the refineries in Nigeria to work because they are making a huge uh, money out of it, and that is why there are uh, airports to sabotage uh, both uh, internal refineries or domestic uh, refineries, whether they are big like that of Tangwate or smaller one like this, Edo, that you are talking about, mm -hmm. uh, because they have the control of uh, the oil sector. And uh, it is all over the news. We know how, uh, you know, as uh, Tangwate one, uh, one time said, foreign and domestic uh, mafia uh, against, uh, you know, his success. So I think it is the same thing. It is these powerful foreign companies that are there and foreign nations that are benefiting. And uh, in fact, even last week, I think one of the uh, reporters said that he was paid to write something against Angwate, which he refused to do, because they are doing all they can to sabotage and to cripple, uh, you know, domestic refineries. So I think this is not outside this. Thing. And the foreigners are being aided by their own luckies at uh, home who are more in tune with what they will get from uh, these foreign uh, powers than to see that Nigeria is a uh, situation has eased. So I think this is it. It is uh, an international politics, a global uh, yeah. war against uh, that, and uh, they have been taking so many measures, denying uh, the raw materials, that is crude oil, now campaigning uh, for the environmental hazard of that, and also the quality of the products. All these ones have been in our newspapers are awash with uh, this news that actually it is a sabotage that is why they cannot get what uh, they need. The, uh, their panelists cannot get uh, raw materials. It's quite, it's quite unfortunate because for a nation that is so blessed with these resources, we're, we're really lacking behind. We're, we're not utilizing what we have. We have all of these refineries that have been set up. In fact, Dangote Refinery is not part, you know, of the refineries from the government, but someone is even also trying their best to um, put something in place and still we're not utilizing any of it at all. I just hope that really soon we can see all of these refineries functioning in their full capacity and hopefully um, it will have an impact on the price of fuel at the moment because fuel is one of our essential commodity and it makes almost everything expensive. If you're going to buy your fuel expensive, of course, transportation is going to be expensive. Goods and services are going to be expensive because most people will definitely need that as an alternative source of power. So I just hope that we start to utilize what we have for the the betterment of our nation. All right, so let's move over. Oh, first, let me take this still on The Guardian, and it's also on the Daily Independent. So it says, NLC demands apology from, from federal government, police over raid on headquarters. That's it on The Guardian. On the Daily Independent, it says, invasion of headquarters. NLC accuses the federal government of intimidation attempt to gag workers. So the, N the NLC's headquarters was invaded sometime last week. And in fact, it was being said that it was the DSS. The DSS came out to say, no, it's not us. Um, we really do not know who, but of course, we can tell that it's a part of the government. And now they're saying that it's intimidation. Do you think that was intimidation? Maybe they're just trying to um, twist the arm of the NLC, like you have to do our bidding, and if you're not going to join us, then we threaten you. Do you think this was a threat to the NLC and even to Nigerian workers at large? 
Yeah, it is part of uh, the intimidation mm. and a threat that is being used to intimidate uh, uh, everybody, especially the organized uh, labor. Um, what we have is that uh, the government, you know, after invading the place uh, and, uh, you know, ransacking their library, taking their materials and so Vital on. Vital documents. So, uh, they just yeah, documents. Yeah, they, they just come out and say that uh, they are looking for evidence that uh, labor is behind the protests, either directly or indirectly. But you see, labor was quiet. They just supported, you know, give Bible support and so on. But I think uh, whatever the reason, it is uh, unfortunate that uh, the government is uh, has come out so heavily to intimidate uh, uh, such a uh, organized sector because it is they, they they are miscalculating the whole thing. By the time you cripple the organized uh, public sector, I mean the uh, labor sector, whether NLC or any other thing, you are just opening chance for spontaneous uprising to take place. Look at what happened with uh, this protest. Has it been the government uh, tolerate, you know, like labor and other things? Maybe it is going to be an organizing. Even if it goes out of hand, you have people who you can, you can hold responsible for that one. But uh, it's part of the intimidation and it's part of the blame game that uh, the government is doing. You know, they blame this, they blame this, and so on. And now they have descended on labor. And this has not been uh, the past time. It's not the past time. For several times, you know, the, the government has been doing that. Look at when they has, uh, decided to negotiate about the minimum wage. Uh, there was physical intimidation, there was psychological intimidation, and so on, blackmailing the labor leaders, and so on, uh, so as at least to cow them down, uh, either to pipe out and uh, back out on the issue, or uh, just be, you know, see coupons and follow the government position. Mm. All right. So another story on the Daily Independent this morning, um, you know, talks about the local government autonomy. It says federal government creating another bureaucracy that will be prone to corruption. That's been said by one of the um, one of the spokespersons for PDP. Do you think that truly, because I know that um, I think a month ago, the Supreme Court gave a verdict that says local government should have the autonomy, financial autonomy. Um, in the past, it has been the governors that have, you know, sorted out the financials of each local government. And sometimes they even put their own people there as caretakers. They appoint their chairman. Um, but now it's saying that we have three tiers of government. So one is the federal government, the state government, and the local governments. With the local governments getting their own um, autonomy, do you think that this is really a recipe for disaster, whereby there might just be some level of corruption that we're not ready for? Yeah, you see, the, the problem is um, it is partial autonomy that is granted to the local government. When you talk of uh, financial autonomy, giving them their uh, you know, share yeah. of their revenue directly, but at the same time, there are certain things that will make them to be still controlled by the governors. Okay. Mm. One thing is the issue of who will conduct the election. It is uh, the state government that will do it, the various state uh, electoral commission. And we know once they do it, uh, virtually the ruling government uh, scores 100 percent of the vote. It, it captures about 100 percent of the uh, uh, votes there. In fact, the only one that uh, people are celebrating is, is, was Kaduna under RFI when uh, uh, the opposition managed to have about 10, uh, less than 10 councillors. But everything was taken over by, I mean, you know, by the ruling party. So I think that is one thing. The other thing that uh, is also a recipe for that uh, thing is that uh, the local government uh, have a three-year tenure instead of four-year tenure. So unless you have a holistic, uh, you know, uh, reform which will make uh, the local government an independent tier or a third tier. Uh, of our local of our government in our governance, I think we are going to have that one. 
And the other thing is, if you now put it through the local government, their finances, and you allow the governors to uh, still control who is elected in the local government uh, position, you are just creating unnecessary bureaucracy because that will give cover to the governors and they will put their own lurkies there, their own uh, you know, uh, people there, and make sure that they tell guide and direct them. And it will be an easy way to siphon that amount of money that has been pumped into local governments. Hmm. Well, I think at the end of the day, we just need each of our politicians to have that political will to do what is right. Because I'm sure there's always going to be a loophole or another. But if you can decide for yourself that I want to do what is right by my people, by Nigeria, then you would turn the blind eye when it comes to corruption. You would say, no, I am a person of integrity, man or woman of integrity, and I will just not delve into corruption. Because if we're going to look at bottlenecks, if we're going to look at loopholes, there will be so many opportunities that would present itself to you for you to be corrupt. But you can have that political will not to be. On the Daily Independence, the major headline here says 22 commercial airlines close shop in Nigeria in 24 years. The writers here says stakeholders say present realities may not support existing 12. Another says blame federal government policies on high mortality rate of domestic airlines. And finally, it says list how government can help sustain commercial airlines operations. So 22 commercial airlines in 24 years, that's in almost every year, um, one commercial airline is shutting down. Of which, of course, these are, these are businesses that are making money. These are revenue that can be taxable by the government. And all of these revenues are no more. What can we do to ensure that you know, we, have, we have a better economy, a better thriving business environment for businesses to just be able to be sustainable yes what can we do because if we're seeing 22 commercial airlines close close shop in 24 years it is quite alarming don't you think yeah it is quite alarming um you see what we are going to do is we look at the reasons why they they collapse and uh, except for about two, I think these are the ones that they say it is uh, uh, security reasons that uh, their standard was below because of accident and so on. But uh, the rest, if you look at the series of reasons that they have given, uh, they are all attached, I mean, they are products of uh, outshoot of uh, government policies. One, they say the issue of, uh, you know, unnecessary taxation or uh, taxation that they, they have. Yeah. Two, uh, is the issue of the, uh, is the fact that uh, this recapitalization that the government said, but that's the they, only way for them is to shut down. You know, uh, three, is that they, they are unable to source uh, foreign exchange, down. you know. Uh, and these are the things. So if you want to improve to uh, the exchange. situation, you know, and, and you have to also so look at it, link it with other things like the cost of operation, aviation, that that you have, you know, the like the subsidy of, uh, there. Uh, you also have to look at uh, uh, electricity tariff. You know, all the things that the government there. is doing. That is you why we say at, uh, uh, the government has failed to look at the, uh, the backward integration between its own policy of this blind followership of subsidy removal, devaluation of the Naira, what chains of effect that it has on other sectors. And this is one of the reasons. 
One thing to change its own philosophy. Policy. A government is not a business enterprise. You don't count the success of government in terms of the profit that it makes. You count the success of government in terms of the services it is able to provide its own citizens, whether they are you know, commercial something or individual and so on. So this issue of the regulations. The removal of subsidy and, so and other so things uh, making the government the more like a business enterprise, and that is why we are having all uh, sorts of these problems. Like look at the airline sector, and look at industries, and talk less of the living condition of the people. So I think it is high time if the government will hear one thing is, let the government rethink over its own policies that are the source of this problem and change gears and policies. take another alternative the uh, policy. Problem. Mm. And change well, gears uh, you and said it right on. on. I feel policy. like they need to look yeah. at the policies, and well, you know, uh, if you they had the right policies, right then on. I feel like as they need to look at the policies on the business and, ng. You know, um, because you right just talked about the devaluation of the naira and all that has been going on with on the business economy. ng. So on the business um, ng, there are two headlines here. One says African currencies threatening against the US dollar. Another one at the bottom says naira rises massively against dollar. To dollar. end week Another on one at the bottom note. says Naira rises um, massively so against dollar. There was a point to where week the dollar used note. to be about 120 um, Naira so to the dollar. When there was, was a point uni. where um, the the before you knew it, it started to increase. As of 2020, that, that was, was even when it went to about um, 300 and 90 something Naira. Between 2020 and 2024, we've seen a massive jump of over 400%. We've moved from about 400 Naira to one. 1,600 last week, and if we look at February, about the dollar went as high as 1,000 naira per dollar. So if we're saying that, you know, we're getting strengthened against the dollar, is that so? If we're saying that, you know, you know, saying something that is not true, saying something that, you know, to make us feel good, you know, because we know that that is not definitely saying something that not anywhere to make us feel good, because because we know that should be definitely naira to the dollar. I mean, it has. Not before in our parents' time, the benchmark should be. If we're seeing one Naira to the still as I mean, high as it has before, I'm saying we're ending on a good note that we're gaining if strength. We're is that true? Is that something we should celebrate right now? I'm saying we're ending on a good note and we're gaining strength. Is that true? Is that something that we should celebrate right now? Uh, celebrate. In fact, it no, is something it, that it is we should cry for or against. When you say I love you, I see you so laughing. Made me laugh too. Uh, yeah, when you were in uni, <laughs> yes. uh, Naira was so about a hundred. Made me laugh too. Uh, 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 to yeah, one dollar. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I laughed. When I was uh, 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 doing my postgraduate uh, uh, yeah. this in, in the eighties, when I uh, was, uh, was uh, 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 a dollar was seventy four, uh, not wow. even a naira. Yeah, uh, now you now change to a, a time it reached up to wow. how many? Yeah, 1,000 plus yeah, 2,000 and, and so on. To, so I uh, think this is not to uh, to something positive that we are going to celebrate. And and we have so to look so at it. Look at uh, uh, one Ghana rebates their own currency. I think now the Ghanaian dollar is about 15 or the CD to a dollar. Others are, are getting cities. Cities. And uh, when the, the other CD countries, the African countries that uh, are, they mentioned are in that uh, newspaper, and, uh, they mentioned the Ghana, they, they mentioned Kenya, and uh, other things. You see, they are on why their currency Ghana, really appreciates uh, uh, against the dollar. It was the concrete policy to make it to appreciate. Here we are, we just refuse to say we are stabilizing it, but we just hijack and put. Uh, the currency today. So, countries that are consumers, like us, 
uh, you know, it today. has been so said over and over that, that uh, countries like that are consumers like us, know, it, it is dangerous and, and it is disastrous for them to devalue their are currencies. Like us. It, it is, is only countries that are producers that when they devalue their currencies, their currencies that they will get the positive benefit of it. For their industry, you know, their product will be cheaper outside and, you know, it will be much you know, if it is cheaper, people will buy it more and more and the industry will produce more and then they will have, you know, employment and other things. But where we have a country like us, which virtually we Employment, employment, uh, uh, everything. Uh, when we do mm. one, but you are just making it uh, uh, everything. For what mm. to we do one. So I think uh, it is not something that we should celebrate when they say the Naira may be associated so by uh, maybe ten kobo or fifty kobo against the dollar. The what we should be appreciated by maybe ten kobo or fifty kobo against the dollar. What we should do in order to, you know cut all these chains of economic and social and political problems that uh, accompany the devaluation of our currency. Mm. All right, finally, let's move over to Nature News. Nature News leads with delayed rainfall depresses right, farmers, threatening food supply in Nigeria. Now, before we came on air, we were just talking about how it was raining last night there in Kanu. And I was telling you about us not having rain here in Lagos for about three weeks. But uh, I'm sure in most parts of the country, we're seeing this delayed rainfall. And, uh, you but know, farmers are now in most parts of the country. They're depressed over it. Like, how, how are we going to get the crops and, uh, if we're not getting enough rain? But what can we do right now as a nation when it comes to, like, mechanized farming or even, you know, using technology? Having artificial something that could work in place of rain. Because if we have, like, this silos of crops and they're being watered, I'm sure that should still work as well. We have like what this, can we do um, when it comes to our agricultural system and to ensure that we have I'm enough sure food supply as well for the what nation? What can we do when it comes to our agricultural yeah, system see, to ensure that we have enough food supply for the nation? rainfall and all, but this is part of the global warming. Yes. But at least we have to look at how do we now go into agriculture to make it all season. We have to look at like yeah in Kano. There was a time, like at the time of all the back, when we started to have, you know, a dry season agriculture, and you know, we have dams and other things that are not being utilized. So these are the things where the government should look into. We should not only depend on rain, rain for agriculture, but we should look at other ways of doing it. All season farming, there are crops that we can. Uh, ways of doing the, you know, dry seasons and, and uh, there are yeah, the ones that, that we can, can grow uh, uh, rainy seasons. Uh, you know. You see, if you look at all uh, other countries, this is what they do. Grow, okay? Uh, yeah. You don't just sit yeah. and see, wait for uh, the rains to come. Like here in the north, okay? yeah, yeah, the, the, the rains are about for, only uh, three to four months like here on the north, average. By year. Yeah, so when it is delayed, usually it will last like two months or so, and that is why you have that problem. So this is where both the government and the private sector should come into, you know, looking at agriculture seriously. Today. And uh, secondly, into, yeah, we have to you know, make it affordable, you know, the inputs and, and the mechanic, uh, yeah, we have to uh, engines that we need, tractors you know, and others in the can go to do so. Uh, we need large scale farming uh, by the government, by the individuals, so. and also it should be all season kind of farming if we are to have food security in Nigeria. All right, I, I totally agree with you with the all seasons farming because we cannot just wait every Every single time oh, for right. the I, rain. I totally that is only a few months. So what happens when there is no rain? We're going to have a time for food the shortage. That is um, only so hopefully the government so is listening. There is no they start to ensure that whatever we're doing with um, so agriculture, we're taking the it seriously listening and making sure that people can get food. Whatever we're doing with agriculture, we're taking it seriously and making sure that people can get food. Professor Kamilu Sanifage, we want to say thank you for coming. It's always a pleasure reviewing the papers with you. Thank you so much. We want to say thank you for coming. It's always a pleasure. Reviewing the paper. All right, we're speaking with Professor so Camille Sanifage from Thank the Department of Political Science, Biura right. University. Right, and we've been looking Sanifage at the headlines that made it to the front pages.
Fund of our National Daily Report. We'll go on a short break, and, and when we're we'll looking at the headlines that made it to the front pages of our National Daily Report. We'll go on a short break, and when we're looking at the headlines that made it to the front pages of our National Daily Report. You know, we're we're asking to, to make sure that our first first politicians are accountable. Talk so about please Sarah. You know, we're asking to make sure that our politicians are accountable. So please stay with us.